When you get to Joshua chapter 6, it's probably one of the more familiar passages as we go through and journey through the book of Joshua. And our foundational text is going to start there with verse 1 in Joshua. And it gets them to the point, the children of Israel, they have now crossed the Jordan. They have prepared themselves and they have taken time to go into battle, but God wants them also to be obedient and not do it their way, but to do it His way. He has already promised them the city of Jericho. He's already promised them victory. But the key element oh, you'll find out in chapter 6 is the word obedience. That although the God's promised them all of these things, He still has an expectation for them to do. I want to let you know today is that although God has promised us so much, even today, He still expects obedience out of His children. He still expects obedience out of His church. And when we fail to be obedient to God, we will also fail to see the movement of God in our midst. And so we look today at chapter 6, started with verse 1. Now Jericho was strongly fortified because of the Israelites. No one was leaving or entering that city. No one was coming in and out. Why? Because they knew that they were on the brink of battle. So you don't have just normal life going on. And because of that, they're a fortified city. They're surrounded by this amazing wall that is there. Uh, it recently, in the years past, it, it actually they found a remnant of this stone wall. And they said it could have measured anywhere up to 11 feet high and 14 feet wide. I mean, you think about the amazement of what was there and done. Houses were built into the wall. Uh, chariots could have ridden or horses could have went on top of the wall. And so this was not just some little rinky-dink wall put up. This was the uh, barrier from being attacked by their enemies. But let me also tell you, this was the barrier that was erected to stop God from coming in. And I thought about this this week. Many of us have built larger walls than the walls of Jericho from God coming in. But when the Holy Spirit is ready to move, uh, no matter how large a barrier we put between us and God, God's going to come on in. God is a powerful way maker. The Holy Spirit can condition our hearts and we can see that just completely collapse in Him coming to our lives. It says in verse 2, the Lord said to Joshua. This is not Joshua doing this on his own willy-nilly. This is Joshua listening to God. Did you know the plans of men will fail, but the plan of God will never fail? Amen. When we try to do something on our own, we sometimes feel like we have been successful. But in the long run, if we leave God out, even immediate success will be like that manna from heaven when they tried to keep it longer than they supposed to. It will be useless. It says, the Lord said to Joshua, Look, I have handed Jericho its king and its fighting men over to you. Wait a minute, Pastor. You, you said that they're about to go into battle, but God speaks as if it had already been done. You see, when God looks at your life, He sees not you as what you are, but He sees you as what you can be and the obedience to the Holy Spirit. You see, when God looks at our little church here, He sees us that when we are obedient to Him, all the blessings that can come in the days ahead. It says that he tells Joshua, march around the city, all the men of war, circling the city one time. Do this for six days. And so they're going to do that. What kind of military disaster is that going to be? We're marching around Jericho. Jericho in the Bible was a beautiful city. Jericho was called as a place where the spring water would go in as an oasis. In the Old Testament, it was often called the city of palms, palm trees. I mean, it was just a beautiful area, abundance. It was the intersection of commerce. 
Deuteronomy 34, 3, Judges 1, 16, Judges 3, 13, 2 Chronicles 28, 15. I'll describe the beauty of Jericho. How many of you know that this beautiful city, once God's people begin to circle it and are obedient, no matter how beautiful it is, it will not be beautiful enough. It says that, have these people do this, and then have seven priests, seven the number in Hebrew of completion, of holiness, carry seven ram's horns, the shofars, the trumpets in front of the ark. But on the seventh day, march around the city seven times. And while the priests blow the trumpets, and where there, it says, when there is a prolonged blast of the horn, and you hear it sound, have all the people give a mild, mighty shout. And then the city wall will collapse. The people will advance, each man straight ahead. Well, I guarantee you they don't teach that in any kind of military school. But this is not God wanting to use them to show how powerful they are. God wants to show them through the foolishness that they feel like that this might be the weakness of man. God is ultimately strong. Amen. You see, God can use you. You might feel like you're unusable, but God can use you if you are obedient to Him. He is not waiting for you to be prepared. He is ready for you just to simply be available. And then it continues to say this. It says, so Joshua, the son of Nun, he summons the priest. Now this takes a lot of faith what Joshua is about to do. Because Joshua was told this by God. The people weren't told this, but the leader was told this. And Joshua could have easily said, now God, that's a good idea. I mean, that's a pretty good idea, but I got a better idea. Let's get these big, big battling rams. Let, let's get these big boulders. Let, let's get torches. Let's get, you know, just uh, uh, ladders to go up on the city. And then we're going to advance. And then we're going to do this. We're going to do that. And we're going to have a guerrilla warfare. He didn't do that, though. Because Joshua had enough spiritual integrity to listen to God, and not only listen to God, but to be obedient, and to even go tell the others when it sounded, oh, so crazy. God might be calling you to do something that seems, oh, so crazy. But I promise you that there is nothing crazy in God's work. It says that Joshua, the son of Nun, he's going to summon the priests, and he said to them, now he calls these holy men up, and he says to them, take up the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was that very picture of God's presence. It says, And have seven priests carry seven trumpets in front of the Ark of the Lord. He said to the people. So now he spoke to the priest. And now he speaks to the people. The priest did not object. Did you notice that? They had to have enough faith in what the leader was telling them because they saw the relationship the leader had with God. Maybe some of you are hesitant to believe what God is doing. But I will let you know this, is that if we have faith, you will see what God can do. It says, and then Joshua speaks to the people. It had to take courage out of Joshua to speak to the priests. But they're holy men. But imagine the courage now to speak to the ordinary men and women, the soldiers, the people there. The people that can just complain and fuss. It says that he speaks to the people. Seven priests carrying seven trumpets before the Lord moved forward and blew the trumpet, and the ark of the Lord's covenant followed them. Verse 9, And while the trumpets were blowing, the armed troops went in front of the priests who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard went behind the ark. But Joshua, verse 10, is a verse that sometimes you might say to yourself, what verse should I underline or mark in my Bible just to really stand out to me this week? To me, this is that verse. And I'm going to spend some time on it. But Joshua had commanded the people, do not shout and do not let your voice be heard. In other words, be quiet, be silent, don't say anything. 
Don't get up in there talking. Don't get in there talking about what's going to happen, what might happen, what could happen, what should happen. He says, be quiet. And you'll notice this. He says, for them to be quiet, don't let a word come out of your mouth, and to the time I say, shout. Because Joshua knew when the right time was. Like the old great theologian, Kenny Rogers. You have to know when to hold them and know when to fold them, know when to walk away, and you better know when to run. You never count your money while sitting at the table. Some of you will get that at lunch. <laughs> and then it continues to say this, some of you that are not young enough, or maybe you're too young to know who the theologian Kenny Rogers was, you can ask your parents or grandparents. And then it says this, it says that he tells them to be quiet, do not say anything, and when it's time to shout, he says you're to shout. In verse 11, so the ark of the Lord was carried around the city circling once and then returned to camp and spent the night there. And Joshua got up early the next morning that the priests took the ark of the Lord and the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets marched in front of the ark of the Lord. And while the trumpets were blowing, the armed troops went in front of them and the rear guard went behind the ark of the Lord. And on the second day, they marched around the city once and returned back to camp. And they did this for six days. And early on the seventh day, they started at dawn and they marched around the city seven times in the same way. And that was the only day they marched around the city seven times. Why? Because that's what God told them to do. And in the next verse 16, it says, after the seventh time, the priest, the priest blew the trumpets and Joshua said to the people, now it's time to open your mouths. He says, now it's time to shout. For the Lord has given you this city. But the city and everything in it are set apart for the Lord for destruction. Only Rahab the prostitute, you remember Rahab is the one who allowed the spies to come in and, and stay and protected them. And then now we find out later on she's going to be in the lineage of Jesus Christ himself. That she was also promised that she would not be destroyed or her family even though her house was there built at the wall, on the wall itself. It says, Only Rahab the prostitute and everyone with her in the house will live because she hid the men we sent. But keep yourselves from the things set apart. This is important because if you come next Sunday, you'll find out why this verse is so important. But I don't want to spoil that. It says, but keep yourselves from the things set apart or you will be set apart for destruction. If you take anything of those things, you will be set apart in the camp of Israel for destruction and bring disaster on it. For all the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron are dedicated to the Lord and must go into the Lord's treasury. And so the people shouted. The trumpets sounded. And when they heard the blast of the trumpet, the people gave a great shout, and the wall come tumbling down, did it not? The people advanced into the city, each man straight ahead, and they captured the city. They completely destroyed everything in the city with the sword, every man and woman, both young and old, and every ox, sheep, and donkey. Stop there. Isn't it amazing what God's doing? These people... We're to circle around and walk in a circle. And it makes me think about they're walking in a circle because now they're in the will of God walking in the circle where 40 years earlier they walked in circles because they won't in the will of God. You see, it's not about directions we're going in. It's about who's guiding us while we're in that direction. Amen. You'll get it. You see, God is going to use this as a visual reminder that what you are doing seems so odd to the enemy. You see, when you pray, that seems odd to the world. Why would you pray to the invisible man in the sky? I hear people might say that statement. Why would you go to church and, and give your money or sing songs? And why would you listen to a preacher? Why would you do this when you could be doing something else that is a whole lot more funner? A lot more better use of your time. But you see, it's not 
you and I trying to please the world and doing what makes sense to the world, we are in the effort of pleasing God for we are called to be obedient and being obedient as Christians means that we are producing fruit. The fruit of the Spirit. But you see, when you go back to that verse I told you that was an underlined mark your Bible verse, we can learn from that principle because here's the idea. For this time period, for that seven days, Joshua says, don't even open your mouth, don't speak. And I want to give you some analysis of why I feel like biblically Joshua is giving this to them. It's because Joshua knew the people. He knew their hearts. He knew that once he told them what to do, then he left the room. That they're going to look at each other and say, can you believe what this guy just said? He's going to have us all killed. While they're marching around, if they were not to be quiet, how likely was it for them to hear somebody hollering down from the wall of Jericho saying, what are y'all doing? Y'all look foolish. And then for Charlie to look back to the person behind him. I know Charlie's not a Hebrew name, but to look behind him and say, you know what? These people in Jericho are about right. We do look foolish walking. In. You know, last time we walked in circles, we did this for 40 years. Right? But you see, when he's told them to be quiet... How many of you feel like there's at times that when God is trying to speak that He is challenged, I didn't say that He stopped, but He can be challenged by us in His speaking to us because we want to keep talking to God and explaining to God why it cannot work, why it cannot happen, and understand this, is that God simply just wants us to be quiet so that He can speak to our hearts. There is a time to speak. There is a time to keep talking. But there's also a time to be quiet. Proverbs chapter 10 verse 19 is a wonderful proverb to memorize. It says the following, In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. But he who restrains his lips is wise. Can I explain to you what that means in Pender County term? The man, and, and just think of it, Proverbs 10, 19, in the multitude of words, sin's not lacking. You go to work and the only thing that person's doing, instead of working, they're... I mean, you're like, does your mouth not ever get tired? I mean, it just up, 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 up. I mean, up and down and all around. You keep on talking. I can't take it. Oh, my gracious, will you hush? Because a lot of times when somebody doesn't know what to say, they just keep talking and eventually what happens is lies come out. Because there ain't but so much you can say, friends. But it says that when somebody keeps talking and talking and talking, sin's not lacking. Because eventually you're going to run out about what to talk about and so you're going to start talking about everybody else. Can I give you just a side little detour and we'll get back on the sermon? If you get around somebody and they're always talking about someone else, don't be so foolish to think when you're not around they ain't talking about you. Come on now, that got some of your attention. You get around them, they're like, you know that Sarah Jane, she boop, 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 boop. You know that Billy Bob, he boop, 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 boop. Well, when you ain't around, they're saying the same thing about you, friend. You see, because a multitude of words, sin is not lacking. But then it says this, but he who can restrain his lips. Lord, that is something to pray for. Lord, help me restrain my mouth. Know when to hold it and know when to close it. It says, but he who restrains his lips is wise. Even the Bible says that the man who doesn't speak all the time, people think that he's smart even when he's not. I mean, that's what Proverbs says. Now y'all want to go look that up, I know. Lamentations chapter 3 verse 26. It is good that one should wait quietly for salvation of the Lord. Do you hear that? It is good. What is good? It's the Hebrew word tov, 
T-O-V. It means that something is just wonderful. It is pleasant. It says it is good when one should wait. How? Not just wait, but wait quietly. You're meditating. You're thinking. You know, we are living in a world so full of distractions and so many voices that we don't have time just to be in a state of quietness. And I'm the chief guilty person on that. My wife will tell you from the time I wake up to the time I go to bed at night, brushing my teeth in the shower, that I'm normally listening to a sermon or listening to a podcast or listening to some kind of news app. Is that not true? I'm constantly listening and listening and listening to these things. I'm constantly trying to gain more and more and more knowledge And I realize that there's times that I just have to shut everything down and just say, you know what, I need to shut everything down. I don't need to be around anyone. I don't need to have something playing in the background. I just need to spend some time with God. And there's nothing wrong with that. Because how many of you know that when we get silent, when we close our mouths and simply just listen to God, how do you listen to God? Through His Word. And when you listen to God, amazing thing will happen. God will speak to you. Now, what we discover here is that they were not to remain silent forever. Now, I'd get kind of nervous if I was around someone silent for that long. Everything okay? Yeah. Can't talk. Well, you just talk. No, you you know what I mean. Can't talk. A silent person can get you worried because you're like, hmm, you're doing a lot of thinking. It's funny, God to put people together. One be talk, 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 another be silent sometimes. God's got a sense of humor. But you understand what's happening here is that it was a time to be quiet, and I love the next part. It says that, and when the time comes, you're to shout. Then shout. Can I just give you an observation? For far too long, there's churches that have been spiritually silent when God has told them to shout. Shout from the rooftop what is holy. Shout from the rooftop what is pure and righteous. And yet we remain silent. There is a time to be silent. You do not, and this comes with age, Some of you that are older know this. You do not have to respond to everything someone says. You do not have to respond to everything someone makes a statement about. I find it kind of comical that I even have a fan club on Facebook. And uh, this fan club on Facebook, and I've showed it to my wife, and this fan club, they make it their purpose in life to attack me on every single thing that I believe in. They attack me on my political views. They attack me on my religious views. They attack me on every single thing. And there's this little group that does this constantly. And you know, the thing is, is that my wife, she will tell you that she wants to respond a lot faster than I do. Because she's like, well, I could tell you what I would say to them. And I've said, I said, you know, no, dogs bark, cats meow, and people that escape from the insane asylum is going to do this kind of thing. The point is, is that no, in your silence, you are strong in Christ. You don't have to defend every single time. You don't have to say something every single time. But when it is time, then do it. Because at that last day when they circled the wall of Jericho and they had the presence of God there, and when they did shout, what happened to the walls? They fell down flat. Now, obedience. One of the great writers, A.W. Tozer, said the following, The Bible recognizes no faith that does not lead to obedience. If you got faith, it will lead you to be obedient. Nor does it recognize any obedience that does not spring from faith. 
The two are opposite sides of the same coin. And then finally, I want to give you one of the great pulpit generals that I feel like someone that's definitely in walking the streets of heaven, Dr. Adrian Rogers. He said the following, You cannot obey God without your obedience spilling out in a blessing to all those around you. You cannot obey God without it actually blessing so many others. Let's wrap it all up and put a bow on it for you. They were obedient to march. They were obedient to blow the shofar, the ram's horn. They were obedient to shout. But they were also obedient to be quiet. You see, in all the details of what they were doing, every single thing that added up, they were... But what if they decided that we'll be quiet, but we won't shout? Guess what? The wall wouldn't have fell down. What if they said, we will shout, but we won't be quiet? The wall wouldn't have fell down. What if they just said, we will be quiet, and we will shout, but we're only that last day. I mean, come on, Josh. We've only walked around this already six times. We've already done this before the last week. Why now we got to do it seven times? They had to be obedient with all things. And once they did, you will discover that what happens is God said, I've already told you I was going to give you the city. Do you know what God... And, and here's the thing. God can fill this church to the very maximum and to the point we actually have to sit down and have an emergency meeting and either tearing the church down and building a new church, moving to a new location, expanding out, doing something. God can do all those things. But the problem is, is that it will require obedience on our part. Being a Christian is not a seasonal task. Being a Christian is not an option if it fits into your schedule. Being a Christian is not, well, I feel like it or I don't feel like it. It's not about emotions. Being a Christian is simply meaning I will be obedient to God's Word. Because why? Because God's Word guides me around every fortified problem that He can tear down. Possibly today you would see a greater move of God if you would simply just be willing to be quiet, be obedient, and watch what God can do. Sadly today... We stand at a point, and Tanya, come on up. We stand at a point today of this. I had a conversation just yesterday with a pastor, a local pastor here in Pender County, and we both agreed this. He had been pastoring over 40-some years. This marks my 25th year as a pastor. And both of us agreed on this. In my little bit of time pastoring and his time pastoring, we have never seen in the last two years what has happened to the church. What has happened to the church in the last two years is that we have forsaken our first love and we have decided that we will be obedient if we want to. That is not obedience. That is actually rejecting God. It is sad that so many people have used the last two years as a reason to pull away from God. It is sad to see that. But the great hope is this. The great hope is that even this fire that once was blazing hot... And I've seen the pictures back from the day, the 50s and 60s. I've seen the pictures where this place, this very sanctuary, every pew was full. The seats back here were full. I've seen those pictures. These were your grandparents that came to church. These were your parents. These were the people that were your ancestors that came because they were obedient to what God said. And if they could see us now, what would they say? 
Would they say, man, I'm so glad to see what my grandson or granddaughter is doing, the coming to church? Or would they look around and say, well, where are they? I know we didn't raise them that way. Where, where is everyone? You see, obedience goes a long way. And so let me just say to you, at one time where there was a fire burning, there still is a little ember, a little, a little spark that's there. And if we are be willing to be obedient and add to it, we will see that fire rekindle even greater. We can. And so in the years to come, someone might be looking through an album of Atkinson Baptist Church, and it might be from the year 2023, and they're looking, and it's the year 2050 or the 2060. Believe it or not, it'll be here before you know it. And they're going to look through that album, and someone took a picture on their cell phone in the back, and they printed it out, and they're going to be looking at that picture and say, wow, look how packed they are. Everybody was so eager to hear God. And then they're going to look at that picture and say, who's that good-looking preacher they had back then? Okay. I just want to make sure you're still awake. But you see, what does it come from? It all comes from that one word, being obedient to God. Today, if you're not saved, I encourage you to please forsake the world, accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I encourage you today to allow uh, your heart to be filled with His love. If you need to join this church and be part of this community of believers, please do so. But don't join just for the sake of having your name on a roster. Join to say, I want to be involved. If you need to be baptized, if you just need to be prayed for. I know some of you have got brothers that are sick. I know some of you have got family that is ailing. I know some of you have got family members that are not saved. Come to the altar and pray for them. Spend some quiet time with God and see what God will do. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day you've given us. And thank you for the message that come from the book of Joshua. We pray, God, that in our own lives that we will see walls fall down. Lord, anything that is stopping us to be closer to you, we pray, God, you will take it away. Lord, what is it that... Why will we not simply be obedient to you, God? What is causing us to drag our feet these last days? There are children that are dying in car wrecks that do not know the gospel. There are people dying in the nursing homes that are not rekindled with the gospel. What are we doing, church? Are we content to look around at each other every Sunday and do the same old thing? Or do we want to see God move in such a powerful way that we can honestly say, this was not Atkinson Baptist, this was God. And if we believe that, God will move. And I pray that God will move before I take my last breath. God, will you please move in this church in such a powerful way that they'll say, I know it couldn't have been Ken. It couldn't have been Carlton. It couldn't have been Elton. It couldn't have been Matt. It couldn't have been X, Y, and Z. It had to be God. And I love you, God, because I know I cannot do it by myself. But I know that with you, we can do all things. In Jesus' most high and holy and precious and honorable name I pray, amen. Invitations 317, you can come pray.